Hello, good morning. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us. Welcome uh, to the Agroforestry in Action webinar series. My name is Gregory Ormsby Mori, the Outreach and Education Coordinator with the Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri. This uh, series is a production of the Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri. Uh, presentations run uh, about once every month, um, uh, and you can find information on upcoming webinars as well as uh, re recordings of past webinars at our Center for Agroforestry website. That's centerforagroforestry.org. Our speaker today is uh, Adolfo Rosati, and he'll be presenting on, uh, well, the title of today's presentation, Olive, Poultry, and Wild Asparagus, Integrated Agroforestry Systems for Mediterranean Climates. Today's presentation will run about 40 to 45 minutes, and then followed from, uh, by about 10 or 15 minutes of question and answer session and discussion. I'll open up a dialogue box during the Q&A session for participants to send in questions and comments. So uh, to our speaker, Adolfo Rosati. Uh, Dr. Adolfo Rosati has been a research scientist at the Council for Agricultural Research and Economics, CREA, in Italy uh, since uh, 1996. He, uh, has a PhD in fruit tree physiology from the University of Perugia, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. He uh, has worked as a postdoc uh, and then as a visiting scientist at the University of California at Davis in the United States for about five years. And uh, during the year, academic year 2016 through 2017, we had the good fortune of having Adolfo with us as a Fulbright Scholar at the Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri. Um, uh, so that was great having Adolfo here with us. His uh, research interests include work on agroecology, agroforestry, and ecophysiology, uh, particularly light and nitrogen partitioning within canopies. He works with modeling uh, photosynthesis and floral and fruit biology and, and tree growth. Uh, in addition to that, he was actively involved in the agroforward uh, project, uh, agroforward.edu. You can find information about that. That was the largest agroforestry project funded by the European Commission during the years 2014 through 2017. Uh, he is a founding member of the European Agroforestry Federation and served in its uh, executive committee as the national delegate for Italy and then as deputy secretary. He was also the founder and first coordinator of the Agroforestry Working Group of the Italian Society for Silviculture and Forest Ecology. And he's a founding member of the Agroecology Working Group of the Italian Society for Horticulture. Dr. Rosati has published over 200 papers uh, on both national uh, and international dissemination and uh, peer-reviewed journals. So um, looking forward to today's presentation. It sounds like a very interesting uh, topic. Uh, so again, the presentation, all of poultry and wild asparagus, uh, integrated agroforestry systems for Mediterranean climates. So Adolfo, please. Yes, yes, I'm here. <coughs> Excuse me, I hope everybody can hear me well. It's proved uh, difficult to pinpoint the exact distance from the microphone, so I, I hope I'll be able to not move during the presentation. No, it's very nice to be uh, back. Sorry, maybe just a, it's a little bit, it's quite a bit louder than our previous test. So if you could uh, back it, uh, back it off just a little bit, it's, it's, uh, yeah, that sounds that's good. Probably, right. It's probably right. better, makes it easier. Is this better now? Perfect. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> Great. I was saying it's uh, very nice to be back, though virtually in uh, Missouri after being there, but Gregory already mentioned that I was there, so I will go quickly to the presentation. Uh, but thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Gregory. Thank you to the uh, University of Missouri um, Agroforestry Center <coughs> for inviting me to give this webinar. It's really a pleasure to be here today with all of you. I'm going to talk about olive, poultry, and wild asparagus. Uh, how to integrate these three elements in a single agroforestry system. Uh, you know olive is a characteristic element of the Mediterranean climate and agriculture. And so um, I've been working on uh, olive agroforestry as a, a model of Mediterranean agroforestry, probably a kind of agroforestry a little bit different from <clears throat> what most of you uh, might usually 
um, hear about so I hope it will be of your interest I'll move forward okay so in Europe we have between four and five million hectares of olives which are uh, becoming unprofitable um, they have been unprofitable for a long time actually except there is subsidies that make it convenient to grow olives uh, but recently the policy has changed and the subsidies have been decoupled from the production this means that the farmer is discovering that he can pocket the subsidies and not harvest the olive uh, and he might as well not harvest it if it costs more to harvest than you gain from making olives so you just pocket the subsidies so uh, since the decoupling of subsidies many olive orchards have been abandoned and many more will probably be abandoned in addition to that um, olive landscape is usually protected at least in Italy but in some other Mediterranean countries which means that you can't just remove the olives and plant something else so you're condemned to have an olive tree and make no money on it so um, I thought that perhaps studying what else can we done in an olive orchard to make some income and yield could be a good solution to keep these uh, orchards in an economically viable uh, let alone environmentally sustainable uh, system so <clears throat> adding crops I'm talking to an agroforestry folk group so you all know and you all agree probably but you can increase the yield and therefore you may increase the income of the farm and uh, obviously in, it can be more sustainable to produce in a mixed crop situation in this particular project as I mentioned I will talk about olive wild asparagus and chicken so why thinking of wild asparagus that's a plant you see in the arrow because um, wild asparagus are a potential additional crop that you can include under the olive trees it is a new crop in the sense that <clears throat> that is not yet cultivated except for small pilots that uh, sprung off out of our projects but uh, there's really not an acreage of wild asparagus cultivation however there is an existing market that's because people traditionally consume this product and they gather it from the wild and the price because there's no cultivation and there's limited offer the price is quite high it can fetch 30 to even uh, 10 to even 30 kilograms per um, euros per kilogram in, a, in the beginning of the season and this crop have been has been recently studied its cultivation has been recently studied mostly by my group but also other colleagues and so and finally it really likes to grow naturally under olive orchard if you stop plowing the soil the wild asparagus usually pops up by itself so you just have to um, facilitate its natural liking of the olive tree a little bit of physiology now <clears throat> why does it make sense to do something like this a study from uh, some Spanish colleagues have shown that um, the olive orchard will produce the highest oil yield when it intercepts 50 percent 55 percent more or less of the radiation if you plant olives more densely together they will shade each other and start growing towards the sky and will re actually reduce oil yield um, that means that you can't really use more than 55 percent of the radiation and the 45 cannot be used and it's basically wasted in that it goes down to the ground and it usually produces weeds why then not using that light for something that is a crop rather than a weed and as you very well know agroforestry can achieve sustainable intensification by producing more things rather than more of the same thing so the idea was to plant something under the wild asparagus under the olive sorry um, this is transplanting of wild asparagus uh, along the rows of a traditional orchard olive orchard this is instead wild asparagus under uh, the row of a super high density olive orchard that is a hedgerow system with about uh, 15 1600 plants per hectare and plants are a space one and a half meter from each other along the row you can plant three asparagus plants in between <clears throat> this is mulching with straw instead of plastic 
and again it's a, a longer row on a traditional olive orchard and um, if you plant the asparagus only along the row of trees you may plant about 5,000 plants per hectare if you plant them also in between the trees in additional rows then you can get to 30,000 plants per hectare this is adult plants after a few years from transplanting in a um, traditional olive orchard that's what they look like the vegetation is a little bit messy looking so the results from our experience in, in this field is that the olive yield is uh, probably unaffected um, we have only empirical evidence because um, it takes years and large areas which you don't have um, to, to, to prove that the yield was statistically unaffected but based on the evidence uh, from the farmers we work with and also on common sense there's not much reason why the aspar asparagus below the olive should affect its yield more than any other natural occurring weed that grows anyway under the olive charger. In terms of asparagus yield instead we do have some data and we find that under the most the, the densest shade uh, in the olive orchard you may get a, a about a 30 percent reduction in uh, yield on the other hand the spears remain more tender in the shade which means that the edible portion of the spear is actually um, a greater fraction so you partially offset the drop in yield by giving a greater quality but you do lose a little bit um, compared to a, just a pure asparagus um, cultivation so this is a local, I mean, this is a, 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 an article on an Italian journal, so it might not make sense to you, but it says um, you put asparagus in the olive orchard and your yield doubles. You know, it's a little bit journalistic, but it's a dissemination kind of paper. So I talked about why planting asparagus under the olive trees. Now, why plant it, why um, raising free range chickens under the olive orchards? Free range chicken is uh, increasing um, because it, it, it enjoys a good image uh, on the consumer side. Uh, it improves animal welfare, it improves meat quality, and possibly it improves uh, the environmental impact of free range uh, of chicken rearing. Whereas intensive chickens uh, suffer of some problems, uh, particularly animal welfare is not as great. Uh, it, it has more pollution of uh, air or um, due to the manure that needs to be um, getting rid of. It uses more antibiotics. Uh, it um, implies genetic erosion because very few breeds or you know very narrow genotypes are used. The meat quality <coughs> may be considered lower um, um, it, and it has a poor image towards the consumers. However, um, some colleagues, many in, in some papers, um, argue that in fact free range chickens are actually less sustainable than the intensive chicken. And this is because free range chickens uh, have a lower co co conversion efficiency. It takes about 3.3 kilogram of feed to produce one kilogram of chicken for free range whereas it takes only about two for an intensive system and since growing feed is the major cost and environmental impact of a chicken business uh, obviously a lower feed conversion efficiency imply a greater impact in addition um, free range chickens need uh, pasture of course they're free range chickens they need land <coughs> and land use is also implies an impact however <coughs> There is no reason why chickens should graze a piece of land that's only dedicated to pasture. Why not graze them in an olive orchard, for instance, or in any other orchard or permanent crop um, compatible with grazing chickens? And if you do that, there are actually many advantages. Um, in this case, we had three chicken cycles per year of a thousand chickens per hectare. Um, as you see from the picture, uh, they're very effective weeders if you have the right amount of animals. You see in a traditional olive orchard here, and you see a little chicken house at the edge of the orchard. You might even see the fencing. The field needs to be fencing, of course, both to keep the chickens in the right place and against predators. Uh, I mentioned that they're 
can be very good weeders. You see where they grazed and where they did not graze, the difference in the grass. And uh, last but not least, last but not uh, whatever, uh, fertilization that comes naturally from the chicken is, chicken is naturally spread all over the field. Uh, we estimated with that amount of chickens, three cycles of a thousand chicken per hectare. Remember that a chicken cycle uh, on a free range chicken is about 100 days or three months more or less. The, the amount you read uh, is the amount you can expect um, from chicken manure in terms of nitrogen and, and phosphorus. So that's definitely more than enough for the olives. In fact, it may be a little bit too much. Perhaps two cycles instead of three would probably be a better combination. So based on the experience, assuming that chickens can do all the weeding and all the fertilization needed in an olive orchard, we decide to um, give some numbers to this um, uh, intuitively obvious uh, advantage of combining chickens and olives. And so we studied the impact of combining the two things with a life cycle assessment using the cradle to gate approach. Um, you probably familiar with this technology, but it, it calculates the impact of every operation of producing something from, from the very start, from producing all the things that are necessary for this process uh, to, the, to the end point, which is, in our case, the kilogram of chicken. Um, we compare then an olive orchard with and without the chickens grazing in it, and a free range chicken system with and without uh, the olive. In other way, in other words, free range chickens grazing on land that is only dedicated to them, or grazing on land that is already occupied by an olive uh, crop. These are the characteristics of the system that we um, described. Um, we had a typical free range system as it's usually done in our areas. As I mentioned, three cycles a year with a thousand chickens per hectare. Uh, that is uh, 10 square meters per chicken available. Uh, the chickens reach 2.8 kilograms and a conversion uh, rate is about 3.3 .3 kilograms of feet to produce one kilograms of chicken. We um, accounted for the production processes only. Uh, basically, the cultivation, transportation, and processing of the feed, the rearing itself, including the grazing and its land use, we did not consider processing because processing was, would be the same whether you graze the chickens in an olive orchard or not. So it didn't make a difference, so we did not include this in this analysis. The olive system was a typical uh, traditional olive orchard in our area. Uh, trees are spaced six by six. We, again, we only consider the cultivation phases. And the main phases in terms of environmental impact were fertilization, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, but particularly nitrogen is the, usually the most impacting one. Weeding, which was done either by mowing or by the chickens, and so was fertilization, either by chemical fertilizer or by the chickens. Then we included crop protection, copper sulfate, a couple of sprays against um, PKKI disease. And um, harvest and pruning was done by hand. Therefore, it didn't have an immediate environmental impact because it was not done by machine. Um, we don't have time to enter the details of um, all the impact categories that are considered in a life cycle assessment. But this is a quick overview there divided up into three main categories, um, human health, including, for instance, carcinogens, respiratory organics, etc., ecosystem quality, like ecotoxicity or acidification, and this includes land use, or resource consumption. So the life cycle assessment will assess the impact on each of these categories. And quickly, these are some results from the life cycle assessment study. Um, this is just to show you a quick diagram of the typical output of the life cycle assessment. I don't expect you to read or get into the details, but basically it considers um, the, or the impact uh, on each of those categories of each of the steps that lead up to the final product. So you see on the extreme right, let's see, I do have a pointer here that I can use. You see here. Um, that's the impact of uh, bringing the maize for the feed at farm. 
the impact stems from growing the maize, transporting the maize, and all of that. It sums up into the maize, and then the maize ends up being uh, ends up in the feed, and the feed is part of the whole impact, and eventually you get the impact of the one kilogram of of uh, meat. So let's see if I can get rid of this arrow now. Um, okay, I'll leave it on the side in case we need it. So these are some of the results. Let's take a minute to understand the graph so that we have it down for the next uh, few slides. So this impact uh, on each of the categories is being normalized. Uh, normalization is um, a process in the life cycle assessment that allows you to compare different categories. Otherwise, the units are different and you can't really compare uh, you know, land use with ecotoxicity, say. So if you normalize it to the average impact of a given area, then you, you can compare them under the same unit and, and compare the relative impact of each category. Um, so the, in each, in each um, impact um, category, you see two columns. The left columns are the free range in the olive orchard. And the right column is the free range outside the olive orchard. Um, so here, you see that most of the impact is due to feed production. Feed is the white part of the columns. You see that for all pairs or columns, the white part is the main part. That means that producing the feed is the thing that impacts the most on the environment when you raise free range chickens. Um, Trying to move forward. Uh, you see that the land use, in terms of relative normalized impact, seems to be the category with the highest impact. Now, you may question the normalization process, and um, it might or might not be something you agree with on how it's calculated. So uh, comparing different categories can still be a questionable process. But within each category, we can certainly compare uh, the free range in olives versus the free range not in olives. And you can see that this uh, total amount of land use impact differs, and particularly it differs for this top part, which is um, due to the grazing land necessary for grazing chickens outside of the olive orchard. Basically, the fact that the white part is the same in these two columns means that grazing chickens did not reduce the use of feed. And this is something I, I should specify. When you put chickens outdoors, they do graze, but under most circumstances, the grazing will improve their quality, their welfare, but will not really reduce much the feed consumption. So we assume there was no reduction whatsoever in feed consumption. Therefore, the two white parts of the two columns are identical. But when you graze chickens outside of the orchard, you have to account for the land use due to grazing. When you graze them in the orchard, you don't need to account for that land use because that is already accounted for in the olive orchard. And so there is no additional land use when you graze them in the olive orchard. And that makes the difference in land use impact. This difference was about 20% in land use. And if you compare through the normalization process, the whole impact then would be 20% of the total impact. So here we have some technical problems and repetitions. but Basically, the take-home message is that grazing in the orchard saves land use in the chicken rearing business. Um, I think, um, yes, OK. So now instead, we're talking about the normalized impact um, of the olive orchard when you keep the chickens in the orchard or when you don't keep the eat chickens in the orchard. So the right columns on each pair are without chickens, and the left ones are always with chicken. You see again, the land use seems to be uh, the main impact. <clears throat> and in this case, it's identical, of course, because one hectare of olive uses one hectare of land, whether or not you keep the chickens in it. But uh, aside from land use, every other category, impact category, you see that the left column is almost or completely gone. That means the impact of the olive orchard has been basically uh, reduced to zero or almost zero. Why is that? That is because um, 
mowing and fertilization, actually fertilization first and then mowing, are the two main field operations that impact on, on the olive orchard impact. When you do that with the chickens, the impact of the chickens is already considered in the chicken cycle, and therefore there is no impact uh, because you're not using machinery, you're not using gasoline, you're not using fertilizer. So basically, aside from the land use, the olive orchard impact is basically reduced to almost nil for all categories except for land use when you graze and weed using chickens. So if you want more details or if I wasn't very clear, this is a paper where you find um, our results and our discussion on the subject. You can <clears throat> find it or ask me, I'll send you a PDF. This is an article, a more dissemination kind of paper, and again on an Italian uh, journal, but uh, we need these kind of articles for farmers that are more likely to read them. This is another article, another local journal that got the cover, so it was nice to see that research there. So I start to do some summaries now. Uh, other advantage of the chicken only orchard combination that are not considered in the life cycle assessment. Um, the trees protect the birds from wind, sun, and temperature, and from raptors and other predators. So uh, the chickens feel more safe, and they will range outside and graze longer because of the trees. This will increase the intake of grasses, which will then improve their meat quality or perhaps induce a little saving on the, on the feed. All of this was not considered in our paper, so there's additional benefits that we not consider. Um, the manure that they leave and spread for free in the orchard is certainly better than a chemical fertilization. Even though chicken manure it, it's not, um, it doesn't improve the organic matter of the soil so much, or it's not as much an amendment um, as other manure, still chicken manure is probably better than a chemical NPK. And in addition, chickens may contribute to some pest control. For instance, the olive weevil, which uh, eats the leaves, but to do this, it climbs up the stem at night uh, or at dark. So um, the chickens will probably interfere with this system. They also eat the fallen olives, and therefore they eat the fly larva, the olive fly larva that's in the fallen olives. Of course, that that occurs when the olive is already damaged. So I'm not saying that this is a solution to the olive fly situation, but I'm saying they can contribute to uh, the problem. And so this is just to show you that um, animals, um, the shade is not a minor thing for animals, especially in Mediterranean climate. Shade is actually very important. And then there are studies that show the economic impact of heat stress on cows in the States or, or you know animals elsewhere. So shade is an important and animals actually need tree. So this combination is, is, is good also for that. And this advantage was not even included in the study on life cycle assessment. This is just some slides to share with you what we found in a chicken stomach when we um, sample them. And this is to show you that they do eat olive pits and grass. Um, in this case, I swear I did not put those pits there myself. They ate a lot of olives and occasionally a lot of grass. In addition, in the spring when olive produce um, suckers at the base, uh, if you put the chicken there early enough when the suckers are just barely coming out, they can actually control the suckers. Otherwise, you spend some good man hours to do it yourself. Uh, when the suckers are woody and bigger, uh, of course, it's too late. Chickens won't help. You need a bigger animal. Again, these uh, uh, additional benefits have been partly addressed in this other paper. Um, so you may look it up if you want more details. And now I'll come to some conclusion about um, olive plus chicken system. So we said that the grazing the orchard saves the land use impact due to the grazing in free range systems. If you graze the chickens in the orchard, the orchard is already there. You're not adding any land use to the free range system. Um, chickens virtually eliminate the orchard and the asparagus, if you have planted asparagus as well, impact of mowing and fertilization. And these are, again, the main impact categories, impact uh, processes. So 
by eliminating those, you virtually reduce the impact of, uh, of, or, of olive orchard and asparagus down to hardly anything. And finally, um, meat quality may be enhanced, and so is welfare and possibly some pest control. So now, conclusion regarding putting the three elements together, we said before the olive yield is probably unlikely to be affected. We said the asparagus yield could be slightly reduced, but partly compensated by higher quality. Um, and as far as the chickens are concerned, of course, ranging free-range chickens in an olive orchard doesn't make any difference uh, compared to rain, grazing them on, a, on land dedicated only to the chickens. In fact, if anything, it has advantages of shade, protection, welfare, and so on. So if you agree that the yield of, uh, of olives is not affected, we can say that its relative yield is 1. If the asparagus relative yield is 0.7 and the chickens are the same, you may conclude that the land equivalent ratio of this combination could be something like 2.7. Of course, um, this is just provocative because what is the uh, relative yield of chicken? Chickens are not raised only on that land, but they need feed from elsewhere. So the actual land equivalent ratio is probably less. Um, but yet, it's a, a little bit simplified and provocative, but just, just to show the idea that by combining things, you're actually making better use of the land, producing more things will, will actually lower uh, inputs. Now, let's switch a little bit on the scale. We, I said before we have about 4 to 5 uh, million hectares of olives. Uh, we also grow about 4 billion chickens in Europe for meat. If you spread all those chickens on all those hectares, you'd get exactly 1,000 chickens per hectare, which is the equivalent of one of the three cycles I mentioned before. This is to say that we have plenty of space to spread those chickens over the land. It's not like I'm talking about something that we don't have possibly space for. You could put all the chickens of Europe in all the uh, olive orchard of Europe and only get 1,000 chickens. If you do three cycles, you could actually get 3,000 chickens. So we, we've got room for three more times as many chickens. And if you don't put the chickens and fertilize the olive orchard with 250 kilograms of fertilizer between nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium, and instead you save that because of the chicken, then you're saving about 1 billion kilograms of fertilizer. And if one kilogram of fertilizer costs about one kilogram of fossil fuel to produce, particularly nitrogen, then you're saving about four million tons of CO2 by combining these things and saving the fertilization. It doesn't even include the mowing. mowing. Of course, uh, four million tons of CO2 is not much. It's about 0.1% of European emission or about 1% of European agricultural emissions. Um, but yet, um, it's, it's something, and besides, we don't have just chickens and olives to combine. There are other examples. You can combine uh, many other animals with many other permanent crops. Uh, you see some articles here of other ideas and other um, approaches going on elsewhere. Uh, these are the black pigs of Spain, the flamos black spin in the Spanish dehesa. Uh, these are chickens in an olive orchard. They do a great job in an olive orchard as long as you remove them before the grapes start harvesting. Otherwise, you'll find them jumping all day and picking grapes for you. Uh, geese, another project I'm actually involved with, it's uh, geese in an olive orchard. They are good grazers. In the case of geese, they will actually, you will actually save feed if you let them graze because they're actually more herbivores than chickens. Again, other example from elsewhere, um, Christmas tree um, nursery uh, using sheep to weed their trees. And if we did this kind of agriculture, perhaps we would need to be discussing, as in this case, people are protesting against a plan to burn the chicken manure because there is too much in the area of Verona in Italy and they don't know what to do with it. So they propose to burn it for bioenergy, but of course it contains nitrogen and particulate and then people don't want it. If we just let the chicken spread in the soil, perhaps we wouldn't be, be needing all of these things. Finally, one comment that I want to make is that 
in this work, we consider no saving in feed because, as I said, chickens are not really herbivores, so they graze and eat grass, but they don't get much, so you still have to feed them almost 100% of what you would anyway. But this is not true, say, for sheep, and sheep could, um, with some care, graze an olive orchard, as actually they have done for thousands of years, and sheep actually eat grass. That's what they eat most of, and so in that case, you would, you would be saving a lot of feed, and so the life cycle assessment, if, if we are going to do that next, we'll probably find out that the uh, uh, um, environmental advantage of this combination will probably be much better than the ones of chicken. If agriculture contributes for one quarter of anthropic greenhouse emissions, uh, and most of this is due to animal rearing, and in the animal rearing, most of this is related to producing the feed, um, then we could be saving a lot of environmental impact and greenhouse gas emissions if we combine grazing animals with um, permanent crops. If you consider that in the world we have about 150 million hectares of permanent crops, and most of them, especially in developed countries, are not grazed at all. If you allow for a third of that to be grazed instead of not, um, you, you'd, you'd be adding 50 million hectares of pasture. Uh, that would be about uh, four times the utilizable agricultural area of Italy. So in conclusion, there are some disadvantages of combining things. Of course, it costs more to fence the field, to manage chickens, to have some kind of night shelter. Um, it's a knowledge intensive system. You need to know about chickens and olives <coughs> and asparagus and their market and their processing. Um, it's not as easy as doing a monocrop. Of course, you could have more people doing it on the same land and have everyone specialized. Um, but um, this provides zero opportunity and income opportunity aside from improving the quality of the product, the welfare of the animal, and the sustainable record of agriculture. So in the face of current needs of sustainable intensification of agriculture, it seems like a good opportunity to explore. So my question would be, rather than can we afford to do it um, in the face of current uh, global problems, I would say can we afford not to do it because of all the advantages it offers if you study how to optimize the system. Also because the alternative is something becoming less and less popular. These are examples of the alternatives which are becoming less popular. So to conclude, um, yes, combining things can be difficult and challenging, uh, but my thinking on that is that we've done things that were more, way more difficult. We've done things that were more challenging and demanding. <clears throat> We master the very basic basics of life. Is that possible that we can't really manage integrating, say, chickens and olives if we put our mind and our research money onto it, if that's for the benefit of um, humans and for the sustainable record of agriculture? With this, I think um, I finished what I had to say. It's exactly 18.40, and I have my 20 minutes for your questions, and I'd be delighted to take some. Thank you, uh, uh, Adolfo. That was, uh, was a very uh, interesting, that was a great presentation. Uh, I was really uh, looking forward to it. And uh, yeah, and, and reading the, uh, some of the background articles, uh, it just sounds like a, a, a compelling uh, approach that can be useful throughout not only in the Mediterranean but Mediterranean like climates elsewhere or around the world. I'm going to open up a, a, a Q&A box here, a question and answer box. We have uh, some time for some uh, question and answers and, and comments. So for uh, participants, um, if you can see that uh, question and answer box, uh, there should be a dialogue uh, window or box down below that. Yeah, go ahead and just enter in or send any questions or comments. Uh, while Rodolfo, uh, uh, Adolfo, while uh, some of the folks are sending in their questions, maybe I'll uh, throw a few your, your way while we're waiting for their questions to come in. I was wondering, uh, Adolfo, about um, and maybe you, you, you touched on this, uh, but I was wondering about hearing a bit more about how, if we're going to combine all three, the olive 
uh, have the wild asparagus and the chickens grazing. What are some, uh, under the olives, what are some of the strategies for, um, I'm assuming if just left, the, if the poultry was just left in a full crop of wild asparagus, there'd be quite a bit of damage or reduction in yield. What are some of the approaches or strategies for combining uh, with the poultry and wild asparagus, but, but reducing impact uh, on the wild asparagus? So the wild asparagus is actually um, very different from the cultivated asparagus, mm -hmm. which you may be familiar with. In the United States, the wild asparagus means um, asparagus officinalis that escaped from cultivation. In Italy, wild asparagus is a completely different species. In fact, it's about eight different species, but um, the one I'm talking about is uh, one of the two most common ones, asparagus acutifolius. And um, it's a very prickly plant with very tough woody stems. So as long as you don't have the chickens mm -hmm. when the tender spear pop out of the soil in spring for the one month or six weeks that you may harvest them, the rest of the time the plant is very prickly. It hurts your hands if you touch it and the stems are very hard. The chickens can still scratch the roots off of young plants, but once the plant is established, um, then it's a very large plant mm -hmm. with solid roots and very and thorny and woody stems. So except for the one month a year, the chickens are unable to, to damage it. And the nice thing is that when you have permanent plants that go through the winter, all the leaf litter from the trees tend to concentrate right under the plants where the wind will stop uh, mm. swooping around the leaves. And then the chickens are attracted by that mulch because they find worms and insects in that mulch. And they go right there to scratch, which means that they seem to be trained and paid for weeding mm -hmm. right around the asparagus plants. So oh. with this plant, it works great. Of course, it would not work with uh, lettuce or other plants. And so um, every combination has to be studied with the right animal, the right species, or whatever your system needs and has. And you have to know what every element of the system can do for you and how to use it. Um, in this case, we found a good combination. Well, we think it's a good combination. Um, it doesn't necessarily work for every crop or for everything. Everybody has to develop right. a, a specific. Yeah, issue. I see. So it's really just a question of timing that one, approximately one month in spring with the tender shoots coming up, and, the, and the, that would be the harvestable product. So you, you exclude the, the chickens at that time. But I guess uh, from what I'm understanding, uh, as you're saying, is throughout the rest of the year, uh, given the nature of the plant there's not much impact um at all uh, uh so that's uh, that's that's a great combination then um we do see a number of questions coming in um uh maybe we'll start off yeah go ahead if you if you want if you want i can just go through them and and start answering um and then maybe as i answer the first one you can see if there is anything more yeah, urgent we'll or i'll just keep going through uh, so the first question is about more specific information about the difference in meat quality. Okay, the meat quality work has been done in collaboration with colleagues at the University of Perugia, and they are the expert. But what changes is um, particularly the um, fatty acid composition of the meat. Uh, it, it, it tends to be less saturated uh, fats with any more the graze uh, grass. Um, in, it's not our case, but there is a, a, some especially good impact on eggs. I, I forget if it was antioxidant. This is not the work I present in, and, and I'm, I'm not involved in that. But I remember my colleagues giving a presentation on eggs. And on eggs, it, it, it makes a special difference in terms of uh, quantity of uh, antioxidants. Um, uh, and so there are some different, oh, of course, there is dif differences in uh, meat texture and tenderness. Um, the animals that graze outside tend to be uh, have tougher meat, uh, which up to some extent is considered an improvement of quality. But of course, uh, beyond a certain point, it actually isn't. Uh, though with meat chickens and young animals, that usually is a, an advantage. Um, and then uh, if you include in the quality aspects like use of antibiotics, um, 
outdoor chickens usually don't need them, or if they need them occasionally, they're not uh, eating them regularly. And so that also affects the quality in, in terms of something that um, the public recognizes. So, so there are many aspects to quality that could be addressed. And I, I'm, not, I'm not the person to be more exhaustive than this, but uh, I hope I offer some, some elements. Have I done some soil tests before chickens to verify nutrient loss, etc.? Um, I'm reading the rest. Uh, yes, OK. So as I mentioned, three cycles uh, could probably be too much because of the amounts of minerals that you've seen. Of course, that depends a lot on your soil. Um, if your soil is uh, poor of vegetation, overgrazed, and exposed to erosion, that's one story. If your soil has a lot of organic matter and the animals are, are managed so that there's a right amount, so not too much, and they're spread uniformly around the surface, that all changes. But I am involved in the other study that I showed you with geese. And on geese, we have done some um, studies on the soil test. They're only preliminary study with not many repetition and so on. Um, we did not find um, very significant impacts in any particular way. But um, perhaps longer term experiments are necessary, and it's hard to say. My suggestion would be um, there tends to be uh, there is a tendency of you know the farmer who does this would likely use his land intensively and there may be many other farmers who never do it. The idea in my mind is to um, try to have a, a, a rotation and a lower amount of animals on more hectares of land, um, and, and that's what integrating things is about. It's about um, using all the land for all the uses, which allows you for grading rotations. Uh, of, of course, the, there could be a risk of uh, leaching if you have too many animals. I don't have much data. The few data that we have on, on geese so far, it's quite promising. But it's only preliminary. It's only one place. So it's hard to conclude. I'm sure that animal load per hectare needs to be considered carefully. But the ideal system is in a system that actually provides feed. And that means it actually has enough vegetation and fewer animals. And if you get to that point, then I'm sure there is no impact. Of course, you need to find enough land to do it. So it, it's up to research to find out the optimization of this whole system. We, we're just starting to ask perhaps the right question. Definitely don't have all the right answers. Um, should I continue through the answers, Greg? Well, uh, particular points? I think you can continue. We've got some, some time. Um, Uh, um, how does the growth of asparagus affect olive harvest? Very, very good question. I didn't have time to discuss these details, but yes. So if you um, plant the plants along the row, then it's pretty easy. Um, olive is usually harvested either by hand or handheld shakers, combs um, with netting on the ground. I found that the netting. Um, doesn't really get stuck on the asparagus plant despite the prickly appearance, as long as you remove the dead parts of the vegetation, because olive um, branches eventually will die. And if you don't remove them, they lose the needles, and then they get stuck on the fencing. If you don't have the dead parts, then it's, uh, it's just fine to, to move the, your netting around the olives. In fact, it can be useful because you can put the edge of the fencing on the asparagus plants which will nicely hold it up for you on the edges. And, and so that works quite well. If you are harvesting in a mechanized fashion with reverse umbrellas, then it's no problem at all, because the umbrella is suspended in the air. The tractor just brings it under the tree. You open the umbrella. It doesn't even touch the, the asparagus. Besides, the umbrella is not a netting. It's a, it's, a, it's a plastic sheath, and it doesn't have holes. and doesn't get stuck anywhere. So it works quite well. In a super high density situation, the harvester um, has precise distances, and it runs exactly at that distance from the hedgerow. Uh, and it cannot move even more than a few inches either side. Otherwise, it will break everything. So you know exactly where the wheels are going to go. And so you can definitely place the asparagus where the wheels are not going to go and manage it with the right uh, equipment. Um, of course, it's something to think of. So. Sonia said, um, 
overload of nutrients. In California, they rely heavily on poultry manure for their nitrogen needs can have in phosphorus surplus in the soil in a short time. Um, yes, okay. Mm, again, I don't have a big amount of data, but <coughs> what my data showed you before is that uh, chicken manure is unbalanced, leaning heavily towards phosphorus. So, of course, um, using uh, chicken manure in the long term is not ideal because you're providing too much phosphorus in order to have enough nitrogen or too little nitrogen if you want to match the phosphorus. And so, again, my ideal system is not uh, a permanent recipe like chickens and olives. My ideal system is something that has more rotation. Perhaps you use um, one pass of sheep when the grass is taller, and then you use chickens later. Of course, the more complex the system, the, more, the, the harder it is to manage it. And, and the more headaches for the farmer who's trying to do all these things. And usually policy doesn't help because it's hard to do too many things under current policies, which are really designed for monocultures and make a lot of bureaucratic burdens for every new thing that you do. And so you don't do scale economy on the bureaucratic border, burdens. And so it's hard to do more things. But on larger scale, combining people with different skills on the same land, I think a lot could be done. In fact, I believe these systems are more interesting perhaps on the large scale than uh, what people normally would assume that this is stuff for only small, small farmers. I totally disagree with that. I think it's the yeah, other way around. That, maybe that leads us to, to the, the next question, Bill's question here about um, uh, the scale of a uh, farmer's willingness to adopt or uh, and uh, also at this point, what are the prospects? How much has this caught on this type of system? And, and what are the prospects for, for more farmers adopting it uh, in Italy or uh, elsewhere around the Mediterranean region? Um, uh, all I can say is that uh, we started working on this system in 2012 on a regional project with European funding. And um, since then, um, we produced a video that got 11,500 visualizations. Um, we received a lot of telephone calls. Uh, a lot of people um, called me up about the systems and how to do it and stuff like that. And I see that um, there is really a genuine interest, especially uh, on the part of young or well-educated entrepreneurs. Um, again, the limits tend to be more bureaucratical, like how do you butcher the chickens legally? It's not easy mm -hmm. when you have small numbers um, putting up your facilities legally. Mm -hmm. it's, it's too costly on a small scale. And so people are finding different solutions. The farmers we started to work with um, mm -hmm. keeps the chickens on a contract with a supermarket. They bring the chickens in the last month because they can claim it free range if your range is in the last month. So they bring it, and he raises them for the last month, and then just come and get it back. And he doesn't have to deal with the butchering mm -hmm. and all of that. And so that's working nicely for him. The proof is that from the start of the project, um, he expanded the shelters and made two new, new much bigger ones. And he's still going with chickens. So it seems like um, the best proof that the, the idea mm -hmm. is interesting, at least to some entrepreneurs. Uh, of course, we're not talking yet about any large-scale things, but I guess in agroforestry, we are still hoping for that to happen on most agroforestry systems. Uh, still nowadays, um, uh, silvopasture, alley cropping, or, or specialty crops etc., are still a minor thing. Uh, but I find in Italy, large-scale agriculture is really losing money, whereas these new ideas uh, don't always um, are not always easy, but if there is hope for farming to to make any profit, is is only in these uh, new systems and not really on the large scale agriculture, which without subsidies actually loses uh, money. Yeah, um, the next question, Eli's question, uh, is somewhat related to that. Uh, what some of the barriers might be if there's any regulations or uh, rules about. Uh, waiting periods if you have livestock in there, in this case poultry, and the, and the manure coming in contract potentially with the other crops. Uh, is that an issue at all, or is there any um, exclusion period uh, from which before the animals have to be excluded before you could harvest uh, either the asparagus or, or the olives? 
yeah, yeah, these are very good points. Um, I'm not up to speed with all the policy related to this, but I must say this is the main difference that I find um, between the states and Europe. Um, when you talk about putting manure or animals in the field in the states, uh, everybody seems to be completely scared about what it can be in terms of salmonella or other risks. Whereas we come from a more traditional farming where that's, that, it, that is and that was absolutely the rule. And so um, I'm not aware of any particular restrictions that specifically say when you can and you cannot graze animals in, in your crop. Um, this said, of course, uh, you might not want ha to, ha to have a chicken cycle right up before you start harvesting the spears. But the spears come out in spring, and um, they come up uh, earlier than before the grass becomes too much competitive. So you can time your cycles uh, from immediately after um, the, the um, asparagus harvest, and then again in the fall when you're still four or five months away from the next ha ha harvest. So if you do two cycles, one in the spring just after harvesting and one in the fall, then you are months away from having chickens, uh, fresh chicken right. manure on, on the asparagus uh, yeah. right before harvest. Uh, but these are, these are issues that if the system spread, this issue will probably uh, become more, more something we're going to discuss. But right now, there isn't really See. much. Yeah, we're just, uh, uh, that's, that's kind of the direction in the United States, very clear regulations about uh, uh, excluding uh, animals and livestock for certain periods before any harvest. Um, that one last question from Olonge Ohiyatun. Uh, it's really, I think he's asking about predators. Is there much predator pressure um, that the poultry would be exposed to in those olive or orchards? Hawks, or, yeah, foxes. Yes, so I mentioned that you need um, fencing. So you normally need um, cyclone fencing that is uh, buried a little bit underground to prevent foxes from digging. And on top of the fencing, there is a, a 45 degree extension of the fencing that it, it's supposed to make it impossible for animals to climb up vertically and climb over because they have to lean back to, to go through the last piece at 45 degrees towards outside. So you need that kind of fencing. And that prevents you from um, foxes and you know, bigger predators, dogs, or whatever. Um, you still might have, uh, what do you call them? Minks. Minxes or you know, some small carnivore um, animal minks. Um, those tend to be more of a problem at night. So people new, usually need um, a shelter that can be uh, very simple and very inexpensive, but something you can close at night. And of course, you need much smaller shelter than you normally do in a, in a chicken facility because it, it's only there for the night. It doesn't need to be there uh, during the day. The chickens are always outside during the day. Um, but, but you need this to protect from those kind of predators at night. Those predators will go through or above the fence. Finally, um, predators from the sky are more of a problem. But um, when the, if you put out very young chicks, then crows and, um, can be a problem. So you need to wait until the chickens are perhaps three or four weeks old. Uh, at that point, they're no longer a problem, whereas hawks and other uh, raptors can be a problem. And that depends a lot on the number. Like if you have 10 chickens, you're likely to lose half of them in 100 days. But if you have a thousand chickens, you might lose mm. 10 of them, but it's not a big deal at all. Um, also, as I said before, the trees will do a great job. Like if the trees are adult trees and they're really covering um, the ground, then raptors can't see the chickens or can't land easily, and, and so the, the chickens are much more protected. If, if the trees are very small or there are no trees at all, then <clears throat> those losses are, are greater. Um, I didn't talk about <clears throat> much about breeds, but of course, uh, an outdoor chicken is very different from an indoor chicken. That's why it has a low feed conversion rate. Um, but I believe we now don't have the best breeds for these systems. 
because no one's been interested in producing the best breeds for these systems, I'm sure that <coughs> we could find a better compromise between an animal that's lively and lightweight enough to graze more efficiently, and yet uh, with a better efficiency and uh, uh, bigger weight or what, whatever you need, a little compromise between the, the most ancient breeds and the most modern breeds uh, would probably be something we would, could improve this. Well, uh, it's been a great uh, discussion and, and really thank you for the presentation. I hope uh, uh, there's an opportunity for more uh, testing and development of, of this kind of system and be interested to uh, see where that research and, and trials uh, uh, produce. Um, so thank you, uh, Adolfo, for, for the presentation, and uh, really look forward to staying in touch and, and, and seeing uh, uh, some more uh, uh, output from, from this kind of research. I want to thank all of our uh, participants who, who joined us today. I think, Adolfo, do you have uh, your email address at the beginning of the presentation? We can, uh, I can... Yeah. I was just going back to yeah, the first slide, so it can yeah, be shown. Uh, I don't know if you can do this faster than me. Okay. Yeah, so in the meanwhile, I, I also thank everybody for participating. And um, keep in touch if you are interested in the subject or need more details or want to talk to me about any of these aspects as much as I can answer. I'd be more than happy to answer and and, and yeah, thanks so much uh, Adolfo Thank and, and thanks everyone. to everyone for participating please check our website centerforagroforestry.org for uh, information about upcoming events we have a webinar on October 24th uh, with uh, Dr. Franz Lubers from uh, North Carolina State and he'll be talking about civil pasture research and civil pasture outreach in the North Carolina coastal plains so uh, thanks again everyone and look forward to uh, having you again with us for the next presentation Bye-bye.